those people on the cover are workers from kind of the dark ages of the cotton mill in my hometown. Uh, those are folks who had survived the 20s, 30s, 40s, and on into the 50s when it was a brick oven in summertime, when the air was so thick with flying cotton that it filled their lungs with cotton fiber. They would hang out the windows trying to get a breath of air. Uh, kids would ride by uh, in cars and in wagons and, and see it and it would scare them to death. Um, these were people that you know, lost their fingers, hands, and arms to the machines and were grateful that they had the work because they came down out of the mountains walking barefoot, uh, came down with all their children in a line and the mill hired all of them, hired the men and the women and the babies because the children were valuable, their hands were small and they could reach into the gears of the machines and unclog them, unfoul the line. How young are we talking about? Oh, eight, nine, ten. Can you tell me a little bit more about the, the town of Jacksonville, Alabama? It's a great town. It's a, it's a, it's a beautiful town. I said once that, that uh, it's almost like someone painted it and hung it on the air. Uh, it nestles uh, uh, in the foothills of the Appalachians, surrounded by beautiful mountains and not far from the Coosa River. Um, it's just one of the most beautiful places on earth. But um, the Civil War wrecked the region. Uh, a lot of people there call it the rich man's war. It wrecked the, the region, uh, starved the region. Then came Reconstruction. Uh, it was almost like the Civil War faded into Reconstruction and the Reconstruction faded into the Great Depression and not much changed for the poor, for the poor. And um, the mill came in the early years of the 20th century and, uh, and was salvation. These people, you know, were sharecroppers or, or subsistence farmers. Um, they dug wells, they cut timber, and all of a sudden there is inside work, steady. Uh, and it, it saved them. And they see it as many of them, the sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters, see it as salvation. How much did they get paid? Next to nothing. It varied over the years from, you know, the, you know, nickels and dimes an hour, a pocket change, you know, to a few dollars a week. Um, even after uh, even after Roosevelt demanded a, a decent wage for them, the mill owner there just refused to pay it and defied the federal government successfully and broke the union. So mill owners kind of paid what they knew they had to pay, which considering these poor mountain people and where they came from was was not very much. Now, as the 50s faded into the 60s and the 60s into the 70s, uh, it became uh, a decent paying job. The machines, while never safe, got safer. Um, and by the 70s and 80s, uh, if you worked for a cotton mill, you were making as good of money as just about any blue collar worker, except maybe uh, some coal miners and steel workers. You said that people were losing their fingers, their hands, and in the beginning getting paid next to nothing. Why were they so loyal because to working was, in that mill? They were still loyal because there was nothing else. There was, there was nothing else there. Uh, 
there were pipe shops and steel mills in the bigger cities. To understand why you would work in a place that kept a part of you at quitting time, you had to understand that, that these are folks who, who don't want to go anywhere else. They don't want to move. They, they don't want to, you know, a lot of their kin folks went up to Detroit and hung bumpers on Cadillacs. But these, it was important to these people to live in the, the mountains of their fathers. It was important to them that they live in a place where buck deer jump across the roads in front of their cars, that they, they lived in a place where their grandmothers put jelly up in the windowsill. Uh, it was important to them that when they died, nobody sent their body home on a train. When did the mill close? Oh, it closed after a after hundred years. I think it was 2001. And what did that do to Jacksonville, Alabama? Well, it, it would be a romantic story to say that the economy, you know, bottomed out and all that, but that's not true. Jacksonville, uh, the mill became a, a lesser force in the economy, although still a force. Uh, Jacksonville State University, a, a, a college, became the, the economic force in town. Um, it wasn't that there was a whole lot of new industry. There wasn't. If you work with your hands for a living in this country, you don't have any champions. And uh, so the, the mill faded out of existence. And a lot of those workers, uh, my brother was one of them, uh, uh, went to work for jobs that paid less. My brother works for the city, Jackson Parks and Recreation. You know, they went to work for jobs that, that don't pay as much, but are not as dangerous and don't wreck their health. Um, um, you know, a lot of them said they'd work for nothing so they could have insurance. So, you know, the town went on about its, its collective life. Um, but the cotton mill workers uh, often wound up in jobs that just did not pay as well, so their standard of living fell. Now, some got very lucky, went to work for uh, Honda, you know, uh, went to work for, for some, some new plants around the state where they had to travel. The, the, the town um, went on about its life, but it really was as though the kind of the, the blue collar heart of the place, that I called it in the book, I think the beating blue collar heart of the place, kind of went still. Um, it is such a, an odd thing to get your hands around because when my brother lost his job, I know that, that it, it, it killed him because for these people, the work is the thing. People love to talk about Southerners and cliches. You know, we, we, you know, we live for stock car racing and hunting and fishing and, and football. And, you know, we, we handle snakes and we chew a lot of tobacco. What we really, what my people are about, is work. They talk about work. They talk about how many, how many feet of wood flooring they laid that day. They talk about, you know, how much pulp wood they cut. They talk about how many bricks they laid. You know, the, 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 what they're really about is work. And if you take the work away, if you take the machines away, and they did, they took the machines to South America, to Asia. If you take the work away, then you take something out of them that can't be put back. So while you hate the fact that it killed so many people, so many people died young and died gasping from bisonosis brown lung, well, you hate all that. 
you also hate to see that tool taken out of their hands. There ain't no perfect world and, and there is no perfect solution. Uh, I just know that it's missed. It's badly missed. What prompted you to write this book? I promised these folks that I would write it. A lot of the folks uh, that I bumped into in my hometown, I had written a newspaper story about it a long time ago when it shut down. And I, a lot of these folks in my hometown, these older folks, had helped me on previous books. And, uh, and I promised them that if I ever could, I would write them their own book. One old fellow in particular, his name is Homer Barnwell. And Homer went to work in the mill. His mom and daddy worked themselves to death in the mill. And he went to work in the mill after World War II, and one day after walking all across Europe fighting the Germans, he looked around him at all the carnage and the noise and the, the people trying to breathe, and he just walked out. But he was always part of the mill village. He, he lives there now, and, and his mom and daddy, uh, again, who gave their lives to the place, are, are such a part of it. I, I thought that all those stories were worth telling, and I told him I would tell the story of his mom and daddy. And uh, I'd see him, you know, at a high school graduation or something, and I was deeply ashamed not to have done the book already. So finally we got a chance to do it and did it for pretty good reasons, I think. And uh, I'm glad it's done. I'm glad it's on the shelf. I'm very proud of it. How is this book uh, different from the other books that you've written? It was, it was similar in that it was, uh, while it wasn't necessarily about family, I did not dwell on my brother's story. I told it in a handful of essays of other people. But they're almost family. These people are friends, and they're they're people that I I know on the street. Um, uh, it's different in that it's the books on family had moments of of even though there was killing and dying and fighting and 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 poverty and struggle and sacrifice. There were also moments where I hope people laughed out loud. Moments where I hope they smiled. This book was a little grimmer, a little grimmer, a little, little sadder. Um, it, 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 it did not, and I'm glad it did. I, I hope that it hit people right in the stomach. It, it didn't give you much of a chance to breathe. So for, and that's going to be my next question, for people who don't live in Jacksonville or even the state of Alabama, when they pick up this book and they read it, what do you want them to take away from it? That the country is changing. The country is, is uh, people love to say, well, we have a service economy now. Well, what do we serve? People work at a, at a, at a, at a, at a I've heard this said, this is not an original thought, but they work at Walmart to eat at Ruby Tuesdays, or they work at Ruby Tuesdays to shop at Walmart. Um, there was a time when being able to pick up a tool meant that you could pound out a living. And with that living came an incredible dignity, an incredible power of, of self and, and, a, and a feeling of, of, of capable feeling where you, you, you know, just hand me a tool and I will make something out of this life. Well, we've taken the tools away. So, the people are still here. Those people are still here. And, you know, they are in, you know, they're in St. Louis and they're in Oakland and they're, you know, they're laid off concrete finishers up in Vermont and they're, they're, they're everywhere. And this book is about them. And it's for them. It just happened to be in my backyard. It was the microcosm, the capsule that I tried to tell. Uh, and they don't have any champions. 
they are are you know as close to forgotten as as anybody I know. So what did the mill closing kind of do to their sense of self? If they take so much pride in building and working with their hands, what did the mill closing do to them? Well, one fellow went to work at a plant that made cat food. Other guys had trouble finding work at all. A lot of the older uh, folks just retired. Um, they did not mill around going, woe is me. They cut firewood. They, they found a way to make a living. They're very capable. But there's a difference in getting by and making a living. They're getting by. A lot of them are, and again, they, you know, a lot of them landed in jobs that pay the bills uh, just barely and give them insurance, which is, you know, the key to everything. Um, but if you ask them if they're still cotton mill workers at heart, if they're still mill workers, they'll tell you no. Like my brother, if you ask him, are you still a mill hand? They'll say, no, of course not. But if you go in his closet and you open it up, all these jackets that he was awarded for perfect attendance, for working without missing a day, all push out at you, you know. Uh, if you open one of his drawers, it is stacked with t-shirts from bass tournaments and company picnics and he doesn't wear them anymore, but he doesn't throw them away. I think there's incredible pride in, in these jobs, like there was at, at being a steel worker in mining coal, building houses, driving a tractor. I think there's incredible pride in these things. My brother Sam said a beautiful thing. He, you know, it's funny. I, I'm supposed to be the one that deals with words and. He's supposed to be one that's capable. And he told me once, he said, uh, Rick, pretty soon the only thing we're going to make in this country will be money. And he doesn't figure it takes a whole lot of people to do a job like that. So I think he's got a good point. 